Yeah. Mm. Today's message title is Treat Others with, as you want to be treated. The scripture passage is from Matthew 7, verse 20, uh, verse 12, 7, verse 12. So in everything, do to others what you would help them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. The phrase, the law and the prophets here, refers to the Old Testament. At the time of Jesus, the scriptures were only the Old Testament. Um, at the time of Jesus, uh, <clears throat> the scriptures were only the Old Testament, making this God's teaching and therefore his command. The command is simple. Love your neighbor as yourself. Think about how much we cherish our own bodies. We give ourselves the best we can and act instinctively to, to pr protect ourselves. This teaching means that we should view our neighbors as just as important as our own bodies. It's wrong to, it's wrong to hold our own well-being as paramount while trampling over others' lives. <clears throat> this command means viewing others as existence, existence uh, as uh, extensions of ourselves. <clears throat> For example, if the workers at, at a power plant decided not to do not to work we would all be without electricity uh, we must see each person as vital to our own own lives why do we cherish our siblings more than strangers because we share the same blood and came from the same womb. Remember that we are all one body, and as God's children, we should consider our neighbor's pain as our own. As I witness young North Korean soldiers being sent to Russia to fight and die in battles, I can't help but feel anger watching Kim Jong-un who lives comfortably and uh, lavishly smiling. I feel the same way about uh, Vladimir Putin who enjoys wealth and comfort while young Russian lives are lost in war. Such people indifferent to the suffering of others are not righteous. Yet the Israelites, God's chosen people, failed to live up to God's command. They fell into the belief that they were exclusively chosen by God so they despised other nations. They even treated the Samaritans people with mixed blood as, as lesser beings. Just as in India, you know, where the lowest caste is often treated worse than animals, this wrongful way of thinking led to deep problems. 
And what about Christians today? While some live in faith, many judge others, condemning them despite their own sins. Conservatives view liberals as adversaries, and liberal and liberals often see conservatives as uh, irredeemably wrong. This division has also infiltrated Christianity, splitting it into factions. Churches differ in their interpretations of scripture and cannot accept each other's beliefs. Using their own spiritual preferences to criticize those with different views. So, why is it so difficult for people to live up to God's command? Why would God command us to, to do something we find so hard to keep? As we start, study the Sermon on the Mount, we may realize our own sinfulness and hypocrisy. The Bible presents both the gospel and the law. The law is right, but it's challenging to follow. The Sermon on the Mount includes many teachings where Jesus uh, reinterprets the Old Testament law. Apostle Paul's letters also emphasize the gospel first, first and then the law, which is God's standards and rules for us. But we fail to uphold these rules. Even if we struggle to keep the law, it must exist because without it, we wouldn't recognize sin for what it is. The law exists to help us understand our weakness and sinfulness. God forgives those who repent and the gospel reveals the path to salvation. Without the law, we fall into sinfulness. Without the gospel, we fall into despair. Today, through the Sermon on the Mount, we are invited to embrace both the gospel and the law as just as Jesus taught. taught. All right, let's move on to the main point. Jesus is telling us be a person who gives love first rather than just seeking it to receive it. We naturally prefer prefer to receive rather than give, right? We want the forgiveness, but it's hard to forgive others. We want to praise, but find it hard to praise others. That's human nature. Jesus gave, gave us the command to love, knowing this nature of ours. But, but why is it so difficult for us to to fulfill this command to love, the problem is humanity's fallen nature within us, what we call sin. Because of this fallen nature, we lack the power to do good. Instead, we feel stronger urges and power to do what is wrong. Be honest with yourselves. Isn't this true for you as well? So, where is humanity? Humanity trapped. Humanity is caught in Satan's trap. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve fell into this trap, which we call original sin. 
Original sin is at its core self-centeredness and selfishness. Every human being is affected by this. Even marriages that start out in love often grow self-centered over time. By Genesis chapter 3, humanity had become Nephilim, or those who live by strength and power, not by God. Today, what is the greatest power in the world? Money. With enough money, it seems that anything is possible. Politicians, too, cannot succeed without money. Creating alliance. Creating alliances between money and power. In Genesis chapter 11, humanity built the Tower of Babel, openly challenging God. This represents the spirit of worldly success. And even Christians are not immune uh, to this. Many Christians, after gaining success, unknowingly become prideful and fall into the trap of success-driven thinking. Many believers drawn into this success-centered mentality, follow their own interests instead of God's, which is precisely the trap Satan sets to lead humanity to destruction. And Satan doesn't stop here. He also establishes cultures of darkness and evil, blinding people with them. Look at Acts chapter 13, which mentions sorcery. Acts chapter 16, which mentions fortune telling. And Acts chapter 19, which speaks about idol worship. These are cultures that trap people in spiritual darkness. When I visited India, I saw people, people born, living, and dying completely conf confined within these spiritual confines. It's miraculous that someone like Elder Satish could escape this. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> that is a miracle. <laughs> I too was born into a family immersed in uh, shamanistic beliefs and idol worship, following my grandfather in bowing to spirits. Satan binds us with traps that lead us to utter ruin. People who are uh, ensnared by these traps have deeply restless souls. The more worldly positions they have, the more successful they become, the more they lack peace. I understand now why so many celebrities, despite their fame and success, turn to drugs, gambling, and immoral lifestyles. It's because of their inner unrest. This mental state is consumed uh, by greed. The Bible states in Colossians 3 verse 5, greed is idolatry. If there is anything we desire more than God, it becomes an idol to us. What then happens to our mental state its police becomes obsessive and addicted. Over time, life state detour, uh, deteriorates, uh, leading to disease. 
financial ruin and ultimately broken homes. Naturally, the, the next generation inherits these wounds, creating a similar family cycle. And where does this lead in the end? A future of ruin and ultimately eternal destruction in hell. Why do we struggle to fulfill the command to love? It's because of the sinful nature, fallen nature within us. This is why Apostle Paul says in Romans 8 verses 5 to 7, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. It's hostile to God. Isn't that total ruin? Being an enemy of God is certainly the state of ruin, isn't it? So, there is something you need to keep in mind as you live your life. Our flesh naturally inclines us toward fleshly concerns, and these flesh, fleshly desires drive us toward death, making us enemies of God. In contrast, those who follow the Spirit focus on the things of the Spirit. A mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. What does this mean? It's about whether your spirit leads your body or your body controls your spirit. Each of you has both a spirit and a body. Who is reigning over you as king and master? When your spirit leads your body, your mind is aligned with spiritual matters, bring, bringing life and peace. All right, so since we can't do this by ourselves, how can we fulfill the commandment of love? First, we must recognize that God has already given us a love that is sufficient, perfect, and eternal. In 1 John 4, verse 10, it says, This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning, atoning sacrifice for our sins. This means God offered His Son on the cross as a sacrifice to reconcile us with Himself. It was not us who loved God first. He loved us first and reached out to us. Wow. It's wonderful grace. And, and John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And Romans 5 verse 8 tells us, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The cross is the ultimate proof of God's love for us. And Romans 8, verse 32 says, he, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, gracious, graciously give us all things? 
And Romans 8, verse 39, assures us nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the love that you and I have received from God. Isn't it Incred incredible? Isn't it incredible? Wow, great. We are so blessed. Growing up, I faced certain emotional limitations because of a broken family background and never feeling the love of a father. But when I understood the depth of God's love, I realized that I had already received all the love I would ever need, a love that is complete, perfect, and eternal. This understanding healed me from the wounds of the past. Praise the Lord. All right, now, in response, we are called to love God and our neighbors. Why? Because we have received this love, true love. Since we have received it, it is now our turn to share it. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, it says, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. What is the command God gave us? It's the commandment of love. Jesus interpreted God's law in this way. In Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40, Jesus said, Love the Lord your Father with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, in essence, God's commandments and laws are all about love. In John 13, verse 34, Jesus says, A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. We are called to love God and to love others and to put this love into action. However, though we know this, we lack the power to actually do it. Why? Because of the sinful nature within us. That's why God said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And in John 14, verse 26, Jesus promised the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. With the Holy Spirit's guidance and power, we are, we are equipped to fulfill this commandment of love. And John chapter 16, verse 13 says, The Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. In Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23, tells us that the first fruit of the Spirit it's love. But there's something curious here. Even though there are nine fruits, in, nine fruits listed, the word fruit is singular. This implies that the fruit of the Spirit is one. And that one fruit is love. All the other qualities flow from this central love. So, the Holy Spirit helps us to love God and our neighbors. 
The Spirit grants us a joy beyond anything the world can, the world can offer, sort of peace that the world cannot provide, and empowers us to bring peace wherever we go. The Spirit gives us patience to endure others, instills a heart of kindness, and moves us to do good. He strengthens our faithfulness to God, humbles us to show gentleness toward others, and grants us self-control over our impulses. The fruit of the Spirit is ultimately one, yet it manifests in nine aspects. Dear friends, we are so weak and prone to prioritizing other things over God. Even while claiming to love Him, though we should love our neighbors as ourselves, we often find it difficult. This is why God has given us the Holy Spirit. And so, what is the conclusion? We must be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, let's apply this message in the following ways. Yeah. Let's move on to the conclusion. First, to be filled with the Spirit, we must also be filled with the Word of God. Reduce the, the time you spend watching YouTube or other media at night and instead meditate on God's Word and the Gospel message. This is, in my view, one of the best ways to pray Praying with a mind filled with worldly thoughts may not receive an answer from God. Prayerful meditation on the world allows us to remove the thoughts of the flesh and invite the thoughts of the spirit, which is essential. When we listen to, when we listen to the gospel, our hearts are moved. Where you, where, whether you listen to messages or read the notes you, you've taken, it fills you with awe for the gospel. Second, when you wake up in the morning, begin your day with prayer. As you plan your day, include evangelism in your schedule, even if you are unsure whether you can actually do it, make time to pray for the salvation of souls. Personally, praying for souls fills my heart with a deep appreciation for the salvation. I've received those who don't pray for soul winning often lack gratitude for the grace of salvation in their own lives. And three, throughout the day, transform your thoughts into prayer. This is what we call 24-hour prayer. Where every thought can become a prayer, as you do this, your spirit begins to govern your body. What, happen, what happens then, you will continually experience God's answers to your prayers, filling your life with the joy of answered prayer. Maybe you, you have certain burdens of conscience or struggles with something God dislikes that you feel unable to overcome on your own. Through prayer, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit works within you, enabling you to lay aside the works of the flesh and turn to the works of the Spirit. Prayer allows us to set aside fle fleshly thoughts and embrace 
the thoughts of the spirit. In other words, it's letting it's letting go of our own thirst to take on the mind of the spirit. This is what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you live in this way, the fruit of the spirit will begin to manifest in your life and you will act through the power of the spirit. Pray to enter into the flesh of the Holy Spirit starting today. Through the Spirit's power, you will find yourself able to treat others as you would like to be treated. Don't worry if you, if you falter. Return to prayer and lay on the Spirit once more. The lay on the Holy Spirit. May all of us live in the fullness of the Spirit today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. We praise you, O oh God, who always gives us your word and answers. Please hear our broken spirits through your word. Wash away our sinful nature with the blood of Christ. Please govern our fleshly thoughts with the thoughts of the Spirit. Please help us to love others as we desire to be loved. We pray and bless this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.